Oh, hello. So good to have your company again. Welcome back to the Gallery of Curiosities. I remain, as always, your humble host, Osgood. We have some exciting news here at the Gallery. We have been selected to be a finalist for this year's Parsec Award for the best speculative fiction short story performed by a small cast. Our fellow finalists are Podcastle, a fantasy-themed story podcast, Cast of Wonders, which specializes in young adult fiction, and The Wicked Library, which runs horror stories. To celebrate, I had the staff up to decorate. They do so love to decorate. Jed carved all the pumpkins. I must say, that woman has a certain way with a blade. Stedman has been busy in the kitchen making pumpkin spice treats for all our guests. Pure genius, I tell you. And Andrew has been helping out giving extra tours around the gallery. We have so many visitors as Halloween draws near. And Kevin... Uh, Kevin is down in the basement stuffing razor blades into the apples for me. No, no, ladies and gentlemen, of course I jest. I would never have Kevin do work such as that. That work must be done personally. In actuality, Kevin is still sorting and reading your manuscripts. But have no fear, we should have that all settled by the end of next week. Now, I believe it's time for our story. Tonight's exhibit takes place in the post-apocalypse. It comes to us by way of Irene Punti. Ms. Punti lives in Barcelona. That's near Barcelona, for those not in the know. She lives there with her partner. Before that, she lived for a decade in Tarragona, the former capital of a Roman province and the city which inspired this story. Her stories have appeared in Gaslandia, a diesel punk anthology, and the non-binary review, among others. It will be read for us this evening by Mr. Wolf Moon. The Cheshire's Grin by Irene Punti Plinius has turned today's assembly into sheer torture with his speech. Many at the Comitium have become fascinated by the hem of their togas, or in Silianus' case, by a signet ring. How can such a boar have produced such a fine daughter? My friend Manius whispers to me. I shrug. Indeed, Amelia is the most beautiful among the city maids. As blue-eyed and languid as a Siamese cat, her skin is pale and smooth as blamanche. But Manius knows I've never set great store by feminine beauty, and I've never seen Amelia display any wit or talent beyond physical grace, although I can't fail to commiserate with her for having such an overbearing father. Once again, Amelia has rejected the invitation to my start of festival banquet. A pity, although I sent it in jest more than anything else. The presence of Plinius' daughter in one of my banquets, even if she chose to remain fully clothed and boringly sober, would be the talk of the city for months. But I wouldn't call Plinius a bore. I enjoy watching my fellow citizens squirm on the Comitium stone seats, and I hadn't seen our master of cultural artifacts tread on so many sandaled toes since he proposed that we take up the Roman custom of allowing masters to liberate their slaves. Even if only one or two Cheshire slaves in a generation were liberated, this would give the rest something to aspire to, said Plinius wandering perilously close to the precipice. The idea of a Cheshire becoming a citizen is so abhorrent that we knew it would never prosper. But still we were shocked that Plinius dared suggest it. 
It may forestall any potential uprisings, and at the very least, it would reduce violence during the Vanishing Festival, he argued. Think of the lives that could be spared. No one doubts that Plinius is the most knowledgeable among us when it comes to the Roman ideal, and yet we all agree that he's never managed to truly grasp it. We love the festival exactly the way it is. That's why today we're so impatient. We just wanted him to say that the smoke bombs have been installed and we could go ahead with the festival. But Plinius never knows when to stop his research or come to that, his speeches. He just had to tell us about the history books he'd unearthed on his latest expedition. You must understand this about Plinius. His father named him after Pliny the Old, hoping to make him into the insufferable know-it-all he has become. I, on the other hand, changed my given name for that of Apicius, the gastronome of the empire. I'm an epicure, to Plinius, stoic. He feels I've lost the essence of the Roman ideal. I know I'm its purest form. To Plinius, the ideal is a Hadrian's wall of accumulated facts, merely a barricade against another total war. If anything, he self-identifies with the early days of the Republic, military discipline, and plain lentil soup. He fails to grasp the majesty and grandeur of the Empire. Plinius will never understand that fruit is at its sweetest just as it's beginning to rot. Plinius despises me, of course, and being much older than me and having an elevated position in the city's hierarchy, feels compelled to tell me all he thinks is wrong about my behavior. I would happily ignore his lecturing if he didn't keep pointing out anachronisms in my garments. I don't care if my sandals are 300 years too old for the clasp on my cape, if this makes the ensemble more aesthetically pleasing. The books Plinius discovered in the abandoned cities, and which he's so eager to tell us about, indicate that Roman statues were not the elegant white marble we've always known and admired. Instead, they may have been painted in the gaudiest of colors. Plinius shows us pictures of how old historians from before the total wars imagined the painted statues. Childish renderings, mocking the nobility of the Roman ideal. An insult! Does Plinius among all people not see how wrong this is? You can't ask people to adhere to an ideal and then keep tweaking it. And then he goes and does it. He cites the X-ray machines, those ancient historians use to seek defamatory evidence. This causes much muttering in the audience, mainly coming from those factions that would love an excuse to overthrow the governor and take his place. A level of finesse clearly beyond Plinius' grasp. Enough, the governor intervenes, seeking to rein in Plinius before second-in-command strays too far. After all, when our governor took his position, he changed his name to Augustus, who ruled the empire for over 40 years, and he can't do so without Plinius. As tiresome as he can sometimes be, Plinius is the only one who knows how everything in the city works. Have you forgotten why our ancestors went back to the Roman ideal? Of course not, Governor, replies Plinius, raising his chin. You know I only seek to better understand the Roman times so that we can adhere more closely to their purest form. I would never dream of trying to understand the machinery itself. Plinius turns to face the assembly. I'm only too aware that any level of technology beyond the Roman ideal would inevitably lead us to industry, and then rapidly to another total war. No one works harder than me to prevent this from happening. 
If I may, my dear governor, says Octavius, using his most unctuous voice, I'm sure none of us question the good will of Plinius. But I think it's worth noting that his namesake died in the Vesuvius eruption, which he went to observe out of scientific curiosity. Is this really the man we want leading us? My dear Octavius, Plinius cuts him off, smiling at Octavius' lack of subtlety in trying to instigate a feud between him and the governor. Augustus is our one and only leader, and I'm sure I have never strived to gain any influence beyond my position. Plinius runs his fingers through his white goatee as he glares at Octavius, a man so uneducated that he once pinned his toga with an Ottoman brooch. Besides, we all understand that a namesake is never more than a namesake, an inspiration not a template. The governor nods. All smoke bombs are in place for the closing ceremony. Plinius goes on, knowing it's the one thing we've come to hear. My assistants and I will use the respite from regular activity to brew the next batches of the revealing draft. There's a murmur of approval in the room and a couple of guffaws from the more excitable members of our assembly. Hardly the sophisticated behavior one would expect from a patrician, but who can blame them? In their month of unrestricted freedom, our slaves provide us with the thrill of being fully alive, an unrivaled glee that makes our bodies vibrate like the taut strings on a lyre. For who can be content with merely existing when death itself may be waiting for you to get back home. Then we shall meet at dusk in front of the temple for the inaugural procession, says the governor, concluding the assembly. Now the vanishing festival is about to begin. We all feel inclined to look more kindly on Plinius' transgressions. The dear old fool. The man is so obsessed with facts, he's even taught his Cheshire slaves to read so they can recite to him as he takes his daily cold bath. One would think this kind of abuse would get Plinius killed during the festival, but he's never showed up with his throat cut by a kitchen knife, or as Gratianus, the merchant, sitting under a cypress tree with his eyes gouged out. More than that, Plinius Cheshires have never even bothered to run away. If it wasn't for the trouble they'd caused to their master, I believe that his Cheshires would be happy to remain fully visible throughout the festival and not join in their peers' reveling. How it must irk Plinius that I, out of all our fellow citizens, and the only other patrician to enjoy a similar level of devotion from my Cheshire slaves. In my case, admittedly, because after I've had the foie from a fig-fed goose, I have no use for the rest of the animal and not having my ingrained desire for personal beauty, my household Cheshires have become pot-bellied instead of the usual skin and bones. Unlike the rest of Cheshires in the city, they can often be heard laughing as they shoo the peacocks in the inner courtyard. We all leave the assembly and go home to prepare. The streets had been decorated the night before by an army of Cheshire slaves impatiently nudging us towards the vanishing festival. The Cheshires have made the city into a gigantic ossuary. Wind chimes made of white painted canes like tibias and ribs and garlands of teeth like white corn hang across the streets. Even the temple's columns have been covered in skeletal decorations. The vanishing festival has always been my favorite time of the year. I'll grant that not enjoying the Cheshire services for a month is inconvenient, but if I can manage two full-blown banquets during each festival, any regular household should be able to function without much trouble. During the festival, a maid may lay with as many men as she pleases and still get married as a virgin. 
a man can grant his favors to other men and not be thought any the less for it. The citizens dance, drink, laugh hysterically, run naked on the streets, play pranks on each other, scream at the top of their lungs. Fortunes are gambled away joyously, or there may not be time left to spend them. Honey wine and mead run as abundant as rainwater in spring, and mountains of food are devoured. Not all of them delicacies, I agree, but then I can only vouch for what is served on my table. As much as I delight in the flamingo tongues and amphorae of fish sauce described by my namesake in his Dere Cochineria, I have of course adapted the ancient recipes. So many animals and plants have become extinct between Roman times and ours, and yet so many others have been discovered beyond the confines of the old empire. I feast on chocolate-covered quail, curry-laced apricot marmalade, and sake marinated oysters. I run home to check everything is ready for my famous first night banquet and prepare for the parade. My Cheshires left the food on the tables before dawn and arranged the red draperies on the walls so the focus will be on the table decorations and the new floor mosaic. I'll only have to light the lamps and the braziers once I get back home. But first, I need to put on my finery for the parade. Nothing too subtle, nothing too garish. I don't want to look like one of those churlish merchants who put on fake armor and decorate their unblemished helmets with eagle feathers, or cover themselves in wolf and leopard pelts as if they just returned from an arduous campaign in some imaginary colony. I arrive at the temple in time for Augustus' inaugural speech, and the procession down the temple stairs and along the Cardo Maximus. Two standard bearers flank our governor as we march to the sound of cymbals, drums, trumpets, and horns. The torches that line the streets reflect on golden brooches and burnished leather epaulets, on the emeralds and rubies embedded in tiaras and rings. Only Plinius and his family his haughty wife Livia and his beautiful and proud daughter Amelia aren't wearing any jewels, if only because they wear austerity as a crown. Poor Amelia, named by Plinius after a vestal virgin. If only she was a man, she could change her name without permission from her father or a future husband. The rest of us parade in our full regalia under a baldachin of make-believe teeth that smile down at us as we synchronize our steps to the beat of the tympana drum and pretend the vanishing festival is ours to control. Then the true procession starts. A silent river of marching skeletons separating into smaller strands as it is too mighty to fit in the Cardo Maximus. The Cheshires are at their weakest during the parade and move slowly and ungainly under the swaying garlands. Their silent procession is much less ordered, but much more solemn than ours. After eleven months of enforced visibility, they get to reveal their true nature, although their rib cages and grins and eye sockets and every indentation on their skulls are still perfectly visible. In the following weeks, as they recover their strength, we'll see isolated groups of Cheshires as slowly vanishing skeletons, dancing on the streets to the sound of the cane wind chimes, or splashing in a green pond, not minding the loud protests of the ducks, chasing each other atop the city walls, or standing on each other's shoulders to reach the tallest branches of an orange tree, while the orchard's owner pretends not to see them. They'll become much more energetic as the days go by and their bones become translucent, weakness being a side effect of the revealing draft they must take daily. 
but the inaugural procession is the one time us citizens realize how vastly outnumbered we are. As much as Plinius insists that the festival restores equilibrium to the city, he's too much of a romantic to admit the festival's true goal, to prevent our slaves from dying and let them get their strength back so that they can carry on with their duties for another year. Not that I'm complaining about the festival, quite the opposite. Although 30 days is not enough for the draft's effects to completely wear off on most Cheshires, and they'll remain visible at least as a grin suspended midair, often with a few vertebrae attached. Each year, a handful of the Cheshires will become fully invisible well before the end of the festival, and then, oh joy, the fun will begin. Will the invisible Cheshire stay put and wait out the festival? Will she climb the city walls and escape into the desert, or maybe to the cities with infinite buildings where the tombs from the total wars still make you sick? Or will he go on a rampage before running away and avenge any real or imaginary wrongs? Plinius assures us that on his expeditions to the abandoned cities, he's encountered many a runaway Cheshire. They take advantage of their invisibility to throw rocks at him, and on his last trip, steal his horses, which really unnerved Plinius, and Manius and I found hilarious. At the end of each festival, the city will contain a few less Cheshires, and a few, or many, less citizens. Some may not have died at the hands of an invisible servant. Every year, a couple of patricians drunkenly fall into their own piscinas and drown. As the smoke bombs are set off and coat the city and its inhabitants in a soot-black patina that will take weeks for the Cheshires to completely scrub off from walls and paving stones, the rest of us will be hung over and fatter and spent from too much lovemaking, and our purses will be empty, and our feet will hurt from dancing. But we'll be exhilarated for having survived, and never embarrassed, not even for our most outrageous deeds, for we have lived to see the end of yet another festival. Some will vouch to treat their Cheshires better the following year, but our memory is short, and our nature relentless, and thus the festival will never lose its thrill. I hurry back home after the parade. I don't want the guests to have to wait, and I need some time for the braziers to warm up the triclinium. The warmth will bring out the scent of the new sandalwood recliners, and will make my guests comfortable in any level of disrobement they may choose. Propriety will be shed tonight, like a carapace we've outgrown. And although parties will grow wilder as the festival progresses, it's not unlikely that a few of my younger guests will want to display their bejeweled bodies. I give a last look at the room before opening the front door to welcome my guests. I've outshone myself with the table centerpiece, if I say so myself. Three stag heads facing out their antlers casting flickering shadows on the walls. The stag's pelts have been kept on, and their eyes have been closed to preserve an illusion of peacefulness. The heads have been slowly cooked in a steam oven of my own design, so that the most daring among my guests may delight in the warm contents of the animal's crowned heads. The stags are what initially inspired me to make the whole feast revolve around a woodland theme. There are also quails and truffle sauce, yellow foot mushrooms, mountains of fresh berries, boar marinated in wine infused with rosemary and thyme, and six chestnut stuffed pheasants with a mixture of crushed nuts and cardamom that my most small-handed Cheshire patiently introduced between the bird's skins and their meat before roasting them whole. I can't see 
how my guests could fail to be impressed. I wake up on the hard mosaic floor. My head pounds. I look at the mess around me. There are metal jugs and pieces of broken pottery on the floor. At least the guests are all gone. The gods be praised. The braziers must have died out hours ago. And the air and the floor are both terribly cold, although I'm always one of the few members on any banquet to remain fully clothed. All the bones in my body ache, and as I sit up, my head spins and I feel a strong urge to throw up that I manage to overcome. I groan. Plinius speaks of the Vanishing Festival as a penitence, and I believe he must refer to hosts having to clean up themselves after a banquet, a thought that fills me with dread too. Flashes of the banquet come to me, truffle sauce running down Pythia's neck as she gorged herself on quail, Manius overturning a mulled wine jar, and the red liquid spreading on the mosaic floor, cackling laughter as a very drunk and naked young man, can't remember who exactly, ran across the room with a stag's antlers on his head, pretending to chase Flavia, who ran away giggling. A voice whispering in my ear, Forget Octavius. He's being used and is too foolish to realize it. Someone else in the assembly will make a grab for the governor's position. You just wait. Rumors, gossip, mindless fun, and carefully crafted jabs. All in all, quite a successful party. The fun continues over the following days. I'm invited to many banquets and parties all over the city. Sometimes I feel I must refuse, as I'm quite certain the host is only trying to get invited in return, or I simply don't want to inflict such pain on my palate. It rains for three days in a row, which only keeps me home during the light hours. Some of the white-painted canes suffer water damage and are replaced. The Cheshires have always been fiercely proud of their skeletal decorations. Every day I put out a platter with cold meats, some bread, and a couple of oranges in the courtyard for my Cheshires, like you are supposed to do. I often see them there, teasing the peacocks. The birds circle their fading skeletons as if appraising a threat, and then jump at their chest claws first amidst the Cheshire's laughter. My Cheshire's didn't used to be this cheeky, but I guess not having them run away during the festival also means they're getting more comfortable with every passing year. No one in the city questions the Cheshire's obligation to pay for their ancestors' crimes by serving as our slaves, although some of us go about it more gently than others. True, the Cheshire's ability to become invisible at will was used by all five sides on the total wars. But it was our side that discovered the revealing draft which gave the Cheshires their new name and position. Before that, we only had the smoke bombs to unmask any invisible soldiers, and they certainly weren't as effective as the draft. After we invented the draft and annihilated our enemies, the total wars were over. Doesn't that give us the victor's right to rule undisputed? Alas, my Cheshires seem to be forgetting their place. I go back inside to pick my clothes for the governor's mid-festival banquet. It's all I can do to pretend not to notice their disgraceful treatment of the peacocks. Everybody who's anybody attends the governor's dinner. This banquet is always carefully timed so that the town gossips have the first inklings on whose Cheshires may make it to full invisibility and who in those housings is more deserving of a comeuppance without any actual deaths having taken place yet. Augustus banquets are by necessity more formal than most, but he makes up for it by adding an extra layer of extravagance. This year, two huge cases containing cheetahs flanked the entrance. I must admit that I'm slightly jealous. 
One of the things that first attracted me to my namesake was that after Apicius squandered his inheritance and in luxurious delicacies, rather than accept a modest life, he poisoned himself. I find that the epitome of elegance. What better ending to a life than the one you choose and administer? And yet, despite how much I spend on my banquets, I've always stopped short of total bankruptcy. That Augustus caged cheetahs are well beyond my grasp or my daring seems like a failing on my side. Although Plinius would probably prefer to stay away with his assistants and work on the revealing draft, even he can't afford to miss his boss's banquet. His wife and daughter join him, if only to look down on the other guests. Beautiful Amelia is looking particularly pale and withdrawn. I wonder if Plinius forces her to remain indoors for the duration of the festival, poor thing. She catches me looking at her. I smile. She frowns. Everything's normal then. We underestimate the Cheshires at our own risk. I hear Plinius berating Octavius. Plinius is so red-faced and agitated that for an instant I wonder if he's drunk, and I tell myself I must remember to tell Flavia. It'll be such a laugh. But then he becomes his old self and adds, The Roman ideal is a discipline, not an excuse to gorge ourselves and drink till we pass out. All this self-indulgence will be our downfall. Sometimes I think Plinius would have us believe he was breastfed by a she-wolf, if he could get away with it. But I lie. Plinius is too honest for that. And besides, he lacks the imagination. At any rate, he's managed to squash the fun out of the evening. Augustus' food is good, but uninspired. And I'm so bored by the formal chatter that I leave early. As I walk back home through the decorated alleys, white painted canes strike one another in the breeze, making a song like peals of laughter. I recognize the ginger cat in front of my friend Manius' house. I know for a fact that the cat's an excellent mouser and a fellow lover of lamb kidneys, so I feel compelled to stop and pat it. Hi there, I say as I kneel next to the animal. Shouldn't you be guarding the pantry against the mice hordes? The cat meows. It turns towards me, and I see fur on its side bending unnaturally as the animal rubs against what it must perceive as a man-shaped smell. A chill runs down my spine. I stand up. Sorry, I mutter, and leave as fast as I can. It's all I can do not to break into a run. Was the Cheshire following me? Was he waiting for Manius instead? Or did he just stop for the cat as I did? Isn't it too early in the festival for him to be fully invisible already? I'm covered in cold sweat and I'm starting to shiver. Even as my legs and lungs burn, there's a considerable distance between Manius' house and mine, and I must reach it before an invisible hand grabs my shoulder or stabs my back. I consider barricading the doors when I get home. But then I realize he's got five accomplices inside my house. I don't leave the house for the next four days and refuse to receive any visitors. It rains again and I spend a whole afternoon wrapped in blankets, watching the rain as it falls through the opening in the atrium ceiling to the impluvium. I'm petrified. I can't do anything about my own Cheshires who come and go as they please. I can sometimes count five skulls out in the courtyard, so it would seem that the fully invisible Cheshire I met on the street wasn't mine. Unless, and I can't believe this never occurred to me before, that during the festival it would be as easy for the Cheshires to visit each other's houses as it is for us, and therefore some of the Cheshires in the house may not be mine. Surely I've always been a kind master? I spend night and day debating whether I should warn Manius, but I don't even know if the Cheshire I met is his, or if he bears any ill will towards his master. 
I don't even know if he's a he, beyond a feeling of physical bulk that may be just in my mind. By its third week, the festival is always in full swing, and any remaining concerns about propriety have been cast aside. For the first time in my life, I don't want anything to do with it. As strange as it may seem for a social creature such as me, the truth is, I don't have many close friends, not even a handful. I was raised by an elderly uncle after my parents died. If I have ever opened up to anyone, it has always been to the most warm-hearted of my fellows, and therefore I always assumed that anyone made nervous by the festival had what was coming to them. To think I laughed at Gratianus, sitting against a wall and throwing breadcrumbs to surround himself with sparrows. He hoped their flight would alert him of his murderer's arrival. We all knew how Gratianus treated his Cheshires, but still, I shouldn't have laughed. As days go by, I convince myself that if the Cheshire I encountered bore any ill will towards Manius or myself, we'd be dead already. It must have been a simple coincidence. Silly me, scared out of my wits by a Cheshire petting a kitty. I'm in half mind to suspend my second banquet, but I dread thinking what people would make of it. I'm home one evening trying out different arrangements for the triclinium's furniture when there's a knock at the door. Amelia? I'm shocked to see Plinius' daughter at my door. She says nothing and comes into the vestibulum. I follow her, perplexed. Are we alone? She asks when we reach the dining hall. I think I can smell spirits on her breath, but that's just not possible. Your guess is as good as mine. I mean... Yes, I think my Cheshire skulls are still quite visible, if that's what you mean. Well, my cousin's Cheshire is not, she says, as if the revelation should make me shudder. And then I understand. What did you do, Amelia? I stole a pair of sapphire earrings from my cousin, Quintina, and I told everyone I'd seen her maid trying them on. Amelia lowers her eyes but I can't tell if it's remorse she feels or shame that I know she's never been as pure as she likes to pretend. My uncle beat her really hard, and now she can't be seen, she adds, and looks back at me defiantly. How do you even know which one of your uncle's Cheshire she is? Oh, I know. She lost her front teeth during the beating. Her ugly mouth has been chasing me for the last week, just to let me know she was almost invisible already, and I haven't seen her for a couple of days. I still don't understand. What can I do to help you? You, Amelia laughs. What could you possibly do? There's shock in her eyes that I would think myself so important. She continues to laugh, but I forgive her. I hear the beginning of hysteria in her voice. There's only one person in the city powerful enough to help me, and that's my father. She stares into my eyes to prove that she still is and will always be above me. But he refused to set the smoke bombs early and end the festival so that his daughter may live. Says the city's bigger than him or his family. Says I should never have taken those earrings and blamed an innocent. She chuckles bitterly. My father loves Cheshire so much it's disgusting. If I'd ever stolen from my mother, he'd have believed our Cheshires before me. I still don't see what this has to do with me. As a reply, Amelia swiftly removes her garments and stands naked in front of me. I shall give you my body to do anything you want with it, on the condition that afterward you must go and tell my father. Isn't this what you've always wanted? No, I mutter under my breath. Not, not really. But I don't think she hears me. Amelia has come to my house to be defiled, and I don't see how I could get out of it and keep my pride. I try to guess what weirdness or deviancy she expects from me. I have her lay on the long table and get a jar of honey with cinnamon and clover I'd prepared for the banquet 
and pour it all over her. I lick it off her skin as she tells me all the nasty things her father has ever said about me, some of which I've heard before, some of which may be true, or she may be making them up. That it is people like me that will bring the city down. That I'm a good-for-nothing, lazy, spineless buffoon. That the few friends I have are complete idiots, or only after my money. Out! I cut her off, getting away from her and pointing at the door. She raises her head from the table as if she doesn't understand why I've stopped. Out of my house! I scream. Your father raised a common thief. Neither of you are fit to criticize me, I say, hating the quaver in my voice. She's still not moving, and there's half a smirk on her lips. So I grab the empty honey jar and throw it against the back wall, as far from both of us as possible. I see her flinch, and at last she seems to get the message. She jumps off the table, grabs her discarded clothes, and leaves the room. A few moments later, I hear the front door close. Presumably, Amelia has left my house fully clothed, even if still covered in honey. She probably thinks it only makes her look more regal. The following morning, my neighbor tells me Amelia's body has been found in an alley behind the forum. She appears to have been hit on the back of the head. Her expression was peaceful, so the general opinion is that her teeth were bashed in after she was dead which is a mercy. It takes me a couple of days to pull myself together. Even if I expected it, Amelia's demise has rattled me. Although now that she's dead, I feel no obligation to tell her father about her visit. I'm forcing myself to focus on my second banquet's preparations. This late into the festival, meals must be fully eked out of preserves, which is always a challenge. Not that I don't do a good job of it. My cod with dates, peanuts, and saffron was a huge success last year. I'm buying sage and cumin at one of my favorite spice dealers. Many customers show signs of inebriation even this early in the morning. I've been uncharacteristically sober for most of the festival, and this has soured my disposition towards more enthusiastic revelers. I chide myself. I mustn't become a grumpy old man. As I'm smelling a handful of cumin, Domitius comes running into the shop. They found Plinius floating on the canal, he shouts. I feel the blood drain from my face. I hear moaning and some barely contained chuckles. Amelia, someone mutters. My head spins. Words boil around me. No one believes that Plinius Cheshires would ever harm him, so they attribute his death to grief over Amelia's passing. I know otherwise. Plinius knew what was coming, and besides, suicide wasn't his style. It was one of us that killed Plinius, a patrician. The knowledge chokes me like a noose. I feel faint. I lose my balance, and as I try to steady myself, I knock over a black pepper sack. The grains spill all over the shop's floor like an eruption of black lava. Cackling laughter stabs my ears. I run away. It's only a couple of streets to my house, but I'm not sure I can make it. My legs barely support me. They threaten to give away at every stride. The teeth-like garlands sway in the breeze, taunting me. I can barely see the street. I can't stop crying. As I stumble through my front door, I fall on the hard mosaic floor and hit my knees. I moan in pain. I hear laughter and see a jaw floating midair not ten feet from me, opening and closing along with the barking laughs. My heart tightens into a fist, but the Cheshire doesn't get any closer, not to strike me, not to help me either. He just stands there as I limp towards my room, pretending not to see him, although I can hear him chuckling clearly enough. He must think I'm drunk, I tell myself. Once inside my rooms, I cover my face with my hands and weep. My chest heaves as I sob uncontrollably. 
I could pretend that I'm weeping for Plinius, but what would be the use? I weep for me. I weep in fear. Now that I sense turmoil ahead of us, I realize that I'll never find the courage to end my life before it's too late. Instead, I'll cling to it with the desperate determination of cowards. Someone murdered Plinius to take him out of the way, an unseen menace within the assembly that will strike Augustus before long. And then what? Plinius and Augustus were never my friends, but they didn't need to be. They always put the city in its safety before anything else, and I can't imagine that whoever takes their place will do the same. Maybe the new ruler will use the Cheshires against the city, or he'll simply underestimate them. I'm afraid that we're living in the last days of the Roman ideal. Do the Cheshires sense it too? The thought terrifies me. What difference does it make to be in the midst of a total war or of a battle restricted to the confines of your city if you can't escape it either way? I hear the sound of pottery being shattered, followed by laughter. It won't be long now. When our technology fails, will we be forced to fall back onto an anachronistic model? Just one of my favorite tropes in post-apocalyptic literature. Who will be left to rebuild civilization? The preppers? Neo-Romans? Steampunks? We might have to wait for the gasoline to run out, of course, which will leave those dreadful raiders and their war boys stranded out in the wastelands. Beastly fellows, those. Well, I see our next tour group has arrived, so you will have to be moving along, unfortunately. Halloween, you know, our busiest time of the year. But I still haven't picked out my costume for this evening. Do come visit us next time at the Gallery of Curiosities. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 Non-Commercial Attribution No Derivatives License. Our theme song is Ashes, Ashes by Deus Ex Vapore Machina. This episode was produced in October of 2018. And if you're hearing this in November, well, New Mexico, second Halloween. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. Does this wig make me look like a Morton Joe? Or perhaps Lord Humongous is more my style? Hmm. No. No, that's not it. Wait, what about Auntie Entity? <laughs> Either way, I get to show off my gams.